Yeah, probably Merge Africa gives me a great pleasure to uh, introduce um, the University of Cape Town um, MOOC implementation team consisting of Andrew Deacon, uh, Tasneem Jaffa, Janet Small, and Sukaina Valji. This team was responsible for, uh, for introducing and creating the first MOOC for the University of Cape Town back in 2014 and has since then been involved in actually all phases of uh, MOOC development and MOOC Im implementation uh, at the university. And it's now just exactly uh, launched the sixth MOOC. So certainly uh, a team that has a lot of experience when it comes to MOOCs. And therefore, it's a, it's a great pleasure for us here at Emerge Africa to uh, engage with the team again and hear the view on what uses that could actually be done from MOOCs if you are an everyday lecturer or employed in, in other ways working with students and teaching. So without further ado, I will actually just give the word over to, to the team. So, Kena, you may go ahead. I think I, um, I'm just going to unmute you. Thank you, Jakob. Um, today we're talking about making use of MOOCs. Um, but making MOOCs is um, one thing, um, as we've been doing for a couple of years now, but the, the, the many ways that people use MOOCs is possibly even more interesting, and we're going to discuss some of our experiences with you today and invite you to contribute to yours um, alongside those. Um, we're going to... Today we're going to um, you know, cover four topics. Um, in, 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 it, firstly, is what are MOOCs and the various types or categories of MOOCs, um, what, the kinds of things that you are doing that you said you're doing, and then offer a, a way of, of, of characterizing the, the way MOOCs are being used um, with some examples. Then through the week, we'll invite you to continue posting in the forums and share your experiences. In the final week, we will extend these ideas of how MOOCs are being used um, in ways that aren't always anticipated, and, uh, and, and, and that's the real creativity of using MOOCs. Okay, MOOCs, they're, they're courses, um, as any other, uh, in a familiar format in, in the way that teaching a, um, a topic is done. They're online, so all the materials are online. They're open in the sense that Anybody with an internet connection can access them, or the, um, and they're massive. They're intended to be accommodate everybody who would like to participate. But there are perhaps out of this, there, there, there are three aspects are probably very important to remember. That the the scale in terms of numbers is is large. So the kind of things one can do with large number of people is is constrained, but, but but the idea is that many uh, um, th that we are aiming to develop a very uh, um, accommodate a very large number of people, and and with a large number of people, we get great diversity. So we have to think of, of the many ways we can include people from with many different backgrounds, and we have to be flexible. People are not always available at the same time. Um, that have different access, different interests, different backgrounds. And we have to design it to be flexible. What's interesting about MOOCs is that they're occupying a sort of in-between space between what are familiar formal courses and perhaps other means of engaging people in a topic, such as educational books. So they're structured like a course, but they're more flexible and, uh, um, than perhaps a book or a, a television program or a film. And they try and 
uh, be, be engaging um, in, in ways that in traditional media haven't been. In terms of the course landscape, they are, are in many ways similar to short courses or non-formal courses, but, uh, it, but are offered in an online space. Um, but they often draw on or are linked to uh, formal courses, so they often use material from a formal lecture or formal online course. And they can be used in formal courses and are being used in formal courses, and they are being used to provide uh, qualifications um, for short courses and the like. And this is all information we knew as we were exploring developing MOOCs, um, but, but there, what, what we are moving to is to see how this happens in practice. We, we partnered with two different platforms, um, Coursera and FutureLearn. They have quite different mission statements. FutureLearn has this idea of pioneering social learning, while Coursera are, are aiming to be provide a very large number of courses and provide universal access to the world's best education. And it's been very interesting working with these two platforms and their different approaches to developing courses. These are our current portfolio of MOOCs that we've developed on, on, a, on a quite a range of topics. Um, and you can sign up for all of these or find out more of these um, later on. But we're just going to give you our experience in in, in as we conceive these um, uh, is one thing, but how they're being used is 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 actually the more interesting uh, is a very interesting story which we'd like to share. We attract people from all, all over the world. This came from a, one of the future loan courses, and this is perhaps one of the, the really exciting aspects is that rather than just teaching a course with students from your local university, you're actually reaching people from over a hundred countries in the world um, it, it participating in some way. Um, because the courses are from UCT, we ha have often attracted a, a much higher percentage of people in Africa who participated in our courses, and particularly in South Africa. Um, and most uh, MOOCs that are on on Coursera or, or FutureLearn only attract 4% of people from the African continent, and, and we um, have reached up to sort of 20% and more in some cases. And I'm going to hand over to Sikena, who's going to um, characterize the kind of uh, courses that, um, that are typically offered in MOOC platforms. Hi everyone, um, thanks very much for joining us. Um, I'm going to quickly just go through some of the ways in which we have conceived of what type of MOOCs are out there. And we did this because when we were first starting our project, we knew that there were lots of MOOCs out there and, and we needed to understand why people were making MOOCs and what the purposes are. And really it's from an institutional perspective. Our institution was asking us, well, what, what MOOCs could we make? What can MOOCs do for the institution? And because of that, we investigated, we took a lot of MOOCs, and we came up with five categories of MOOCs. This is not um, ex um, the, the final story. There's probably more categories and more types, but these were the five categories that seem to make most sense to us. And we're sharing this with you just to... Um, make the whole kind of how to understand MOOCs um, a little bit more nuanced to, to, to look at some of the purposes behind and um, why many institutions around the world are making MOOCs. So if I go through you know, quite quickly some of the courses, our first category is what we call the teaching showcase. Um, these uh, tend to be courses that are um, of general interest, quite high profile topics, reasonably accessible topics that really anybody can do, perhaps um, at an undergraduate level um, type, of, type of engagement expected. And it generally the purpose is 
to showcase the institution or the institution's teaching by means of an engaging subject or um, one that is led by an a engaging um, academic or personality. Generally, um, there's global interest, or um, and these types of topics match what many people think MOOCs are or initially were, which were really exciting topics that people flocked to in large numbers. And two of our courses, um, Medicine and the Arts, Humanizing Healthcare, and What is the Mind, these were our first two MOOCs offered on the FutureLearn platform, fit this particular category. So that's what we're calling the Teaching Showcase. Our second category, which we call Gateway Skills, is quite quite different. These are the types of courses that provide um, a, a gateway into a new um, level of study, perhaps. So they provide foundational bridging enhancement skills, often for pre-higher education entry, uh, preparing for university, for example, or they might help um, students at undergraduate level transition to, to a, a different topic or a different area in order for them to, to um, achieve the next stage of their um, educational journey. Um, these are often local, you know, of local interest, um, but a bit more inward living, in, inward looking perhaps. And um, currently amongst our six um, MOOCs, we don't have a gateway course. Um, the example here is an introdu introduction to statistics um, course, but we are currently developing one. Um, amongst our portfolio, which will be uh, focused on um, developing writing and critical thinking skills for um, students entering university, so that kind of level. Our third category we've called graduate literacies, um, and this is these are types of courses that help um, postgraduate students um, to in their, in their next educational journey. They might support a particular program of study, um, and they're focused on building postgraduate literacy. That could be um, statistics, that could be um, research skills. And our, one of our courses, uh, which is called Understanding Clinical Research Behind the Statistics, is in this particular category. And um, this course, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later um, in, when we talk about uses, um, is, is designed to support um, students like our um, MMS students, uh, Masters in Medical Education students, um, start their research projects. Our fourth category, which we call professional showcase, are types of courses that are geared more towards career building or vocational skills or vocational skill development. It could be retooling or professional development. They are often um, offered in conjunction with professional bodies or aligned with some of the standards that professional bodies might um, expect. Um, one of our courses, um, a, new, a re reasonably new course, Education for All, Disability, Diversity and Inclusion, falls under this category where it supports the professional development of teachers who um, are um, trying to or need to um, integrate the um, inclusion of children with disabilities um, into mainstream classes and, and um, in particularly in low resource contexts. And our fifth category, um, which is we call the research showcase, is also um, similar to the teaching showcase, generally an engaging, broad topic, but this is a more sometimes more specialist focus in that topic. Um, it assumes some background um, understanding or knowledge of the topic, but it's still geared towards, um, could be geared towards general leisure learning. Um, and in this case, um, our climate change mitigation in developing countries course falls um, in, in this category. So. Um, we have um, developed these five categories, and it was a way of us understanding why our institution or institutions might offer MOOCs, and what, if you have a particular purpose for a MOOC, if it falls into a particular category, then that impacts on how the, the, that um, course is designed, how it's um, possibly used, and also what sort of audiences need to be um, accommodated. So that's the, the type, and I'm going to hand over to Janet Small now in our team, who's going to take us through the kind of more discussion part of the seminar. Um, sorry, I'm just moving a little bit to the mic, so apologies for that. Um, so we just thought we should, we, we really interested in the opportunity that's been provided because we know that lots of people have been making use of MOOCs, and so we started off by 
just combining information from the, um, the pre-course questionnaire that you very kindly all filled out. And uh, you'll see uh, on the graph that there's quite a lot of South Africans here, and I see a fair number of you in the forum. Hello, everybody. In this, particularly those in the Western Cape, it's a pretty rainy, horrible day. But luckily, we um, have the virtue of communicating online, so it doesn't affect us right now. And then there's a few, some of us from the rest of Africa and the rest of the world. So there's a bit of a diversity in this uh, virtual classroom. Uh, we have, from of those of, who, of you who filled the questionnaire in, we've got quite a number of people who have enrolled in a few MOOCs. And some, quite a few who involved, enrolled in a number, or quite a number. So we haven't asked the many. Obviously, there's a wide range. But I think we'll see from the discussions that have already started, people have got quite a lot of experience now of taking and making use of MOOCs, which we're really interested in further discussing. Um, of the people who've, who said they had taken had, had um, taken MOOCs, 70% uh, said they had completed one, which is pretty impressive, actually, since, as we know already from the discussions, that um, there's, that's one of the big issues around MOOC, um, particularly in the sort of mainstream media, is the completion rates. But we'll come back to that, I think, in, a, in some, of the, some of the discussions we go through. And it's a lot of it's about what is your purpose in taking a MOOC. Okay, so we're going to move on. That was just to sort of pull us all into the room together and the virtual room to say, well, we all have experiences of taking MOOCs. Let's talk a bit about why and what the various uses could be um, to, uh, of MOOCs. So what we'll do here is talk about, I think we had five uses that we could, uh, six uses that we uh, described, but we obviously, they're not, that's not complete. So we're going to put, uh, describe these six uses based on knowledge we have of the way people have made use of MOOCs. As Andrew was saying that we first presented the sort of designer perspective of what we intended, and now we're looking rather at the use, of what people do with them. So one of the ways we've seen people making use of materials, you know, in fact, of MOOCs, are actually making use of the MOOC materials. Where the courses are uh, particularly released as open education material, which they would be the case in all of our MOOCs, we try and give an open, shareable license for material, which would allow people to download and make use of it. So one example we've heard about from interviewing people were uh, occupational therapists who were struggling to find a way to get further staff development. And so they downloaded some of the video material because they didn't have great internet connectivity to do uh, and at the same time sort of online. They downloaded the material and then used it for kind of staff development seminars. So that's an example we would call making use of the MOOC as open education resource material. So we'd lo I'd like to hear from you if any of you have um, made use of it like this or um, had any experience of that. And as we, as I just explained, that that would mean we'd need to make the material easy to share, which is one of the Creative Commons licenses would be put on almost all the material we're making use of. Um, the next sort of major category of use that we've seen would be what we're calling as part of a pres prescribed task. So it's where an academic would say, like they would do for a reading, would say, please take the MOOC or these aspects of the MOOC as part of what you are doing in my course. And I think somebody talked about this in the forums that I was looking at yesterday, about prescribing a MOOC or a part of a MOOC as supplementary or um, add-on to the teaching, the core teaching they're doing as an academic. An example we come across is a university um, in, in Asia which has prescribed the What is the Mind course and then asking their students to write an essay based on that. So it's almost like prescribing a reading and requiring people to write up about it. So then I'm going to hand over to, um, to, to Andrew to talk about um, the flipped classroom model, which is basically where we say... Um, where we talk about um, people using the MOOC as part of their teaching. So in, in this course, um, the, 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 the challenge was um, to get speakers to uh, talk to the students was quite challenging, and to record them seemed a very good idea. 
And if we were recording them, th 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 this actually could be used as a as a, a as a um, it could be shared out the, as a as a MOOC as well. And so this course had multiple ideas of how we could um, engage a class of of, of master students, um, invite a whole lot of experts to uh, um, present, and we would film them, and then use that in the course to help students um, make sense of their readings, because we'd have experts talk about what was um, happening in their field. And the, the, the way that we did this was um, the, the course had 14 weeks, which are the green boxes at the, uh, near the bottom. And, and these were each a seminar. And the idea here is that, that students would um, do the readings and be able to come to the class and, and talk about it. But as beginner researchers in a completely new field, this is really quite challenging. And the, and the vision that these lecturers had was to ha have somebody who's an expert in the field you know, talk and engage and open up the topics. And we did this through the, the MOOC. And so in parallel to the course, they also did the MOOC where the same topics were introduced. And then they could go on to do the readings. And in fact, in the course, there were some, also some public lectures linked to the course. And those are the dotted um, uh, uh, boxes from weeks 9 to 12. Um, and this was a very interesting idea of, of really stimulating a, a class through introducing, um, the, uh, through using the MOOC in parallel to the uh, course. Um, and the next example, um, Tasneem is going to introduce on bridging. Hi guys, um, vision is basically when a lecturer recommends a course to perhaps formal students. So for example, we have, as I kind of mentioned earlier, understanding clinical research, which we produce. And they recommend those, that, that course to the Masters of Medicine students. So before they actually start their Masters, they are recommended to do this course so they can acquire some research skills which will make their dissertation a bit easier. The next one is wrapping. So wrapping is where you have a study group. Uh, this can be face-to-face -face, together with an in-person facilitator who might localize or contextualize the MOOC. So, for example, at UCT, we have the postgraduate office, office who runs sessions for certain selected MOOCs, so academic or professional MOOCs, so statistics or public speaking. And what they do, they provide weekly sessions with a local facilitator to contextualize the context to UCT, especially because these MOOCs have been uh, made in a Western context, so they're not always applicable to our students. The next one we have partnering, which is channels will take over. Okay, so this is a more sort of formal arrangement, which isn't always possible. But in this instance, there was um, like there was a course made, a MOOC made, and then an agreement entered between a local body here in Cape Town at UCT, and I think there's also a partner in Kenya which offers the Copyright X course as a kind of almost like a taught um, parallel course where they would cover local, particularly local issues. And that was a very, very useful model for that set of um, materials, since it was dependent on, on understanding both the broad questions around copyright law as well as the specifics of the local context. So it was really a suitable format. Um, so those were the ways that we have seen the MOOCs that we've made being used. And we're very interested to hear from you about what um, you've come across. And there's been some discussions picking up here in the chat, which we've been trying to follow. And things like Yolanda's been talking about how sometimes things like prescribing is difficult because of timing. These are interesting points. The other things that you talked about in the pre-course survey, where you, would, you have asked people to um, advise students to look for MOOCs that could help their skills and so on. So I think we, we are seeing some uses already emerging. Um, quite often uh, people have used them themselves. I think that's something we've all done is find a way of using MOOCs for our own either professional development or sort of develop some skill, some aspect of skill we need. Um, and then you've also talked about recommending. So, uh, of, uh, 
respond to that question, I think 56% of the people who responded said they have recommended MOOCs to others, I think either formally to students or otherwise as people that you, who are looking for a way to uh, acquire new information and knowledge. So I'm not going to read through these comments, but I, I, what we were hoping for um, today and also following up during the next few days is some sort of thoughts from you about if the other uses that we haven't really mentioned coming up in the seminar so far, and whether or some of the challenges around using them. So some of the questions that we're discussing here in the forum about the timing. So if you wanted to use MOOCs, you've, uh, Yolanda's been saying she's looked at it quite seriously, but often finds the timing to be a problem. So that's clearly an, an issue which is going to impact on certain ways of using it. Um, then, then, then obviously the downloading of material is that you could, um, you, it depends a bit on the licensing issue. And um, um, Yolanda's raising a point about validation. Um, I'm not sure if you want to elaborate on that point, Yolanda, I'm not sure what you're getting at about that. Is it the fact that the material isn't available for the context? Uh, or the culture, yeah, exactly. That's the issue which we were talking about where you can use the MOOC material, but you need to sort of, in a sense, bring it into the classroom and discuss where these are their dissonances that people find is not appropriate. I don't know how much uh, that's been affected, it's been an issue that's affected other people's use of MOOCs. It would be good to hear about that both in the, um, in the discussion here but also going forward. So we, we're looking, we, we're just very, we, we think it will be quite a valuable discussion for us to have in our context about these issues around barriers and constraints as well as looking at what the other opportunities there are that we haven't yet tackled. So uh, the issue of sort of making use of material that hasn't been produced from your context, I think the challenge that relates to all shareable material, whether it's a general OER or a MOOC. So I'd be interested to hear some further discussion from people in the room about how you, you see uh, ways of getting around those challenges. Does it mean it's not usable or does it mean you have to do something else when you're making use of it? I don't know whether anybody else would like to um, comment from the team here. Um, Yolanda is saying there that sometimes it, that the way people use material has a cultural uh, sort of impact and uh, you know, offends people because it's got a different context. And I'm sure that applies to even if you're prescribing readings or other materials. So it's, it's really interesting to me to think about the way in which you deal with you know, um, bringing the, the, the use of the material into your ongoing teaching. So anybody else would like to comment on this? Coming out here. Yeah, so the, the word that we used in our example that describes what one of the suggestions Janet made is, is wrapping. But there might be other terms that uh, would characterize what you need to do to add to a MOOC to make it uh, um, more accessible to students in your, in your context. I see that the time constraint is issue coming up quite a lot here, but that seems to me that would be a particular use. So the time constraint would seem to be applicable if, you try, if you're trying to make it concurrent, the whole course concurrent to your course. Are there not other ways in which you could make use of the material that didn't require such a, a careful scheduling of time to time? Yes, if I if I just pick up on that, um, and just picking up, um, maybe just to clarify between the first two uses. Um, so the first use that we presented, which was about using the MOOC materials as OER, which is really about using elements of the course as materials for your own teaching or to support students, is really that you take those materials out of the context of the course in it and, and make and recontextualize them for your course, perhaps. Um, the second use that we introduced, which was about prescribing, is probably worth just unpacking it a little bit more, because the way that we've seen it, it's used in a number of ways, but, but one of the values of it is that you prescribe not only the materials in a sequence format, but the kind of pedagogical design around it. 
so the experience that your students might have, say, if they took a six-week course with this particular group, you know, with a worldwide broad audience, that there's something to be gained pedagogically about that experience that, that then enhances whatever learning outcomes you might have. But I think the, the barriers is, that has be, have been mentioned there is the, the timing, for, for firstly, could be an issue because... Um, if that course starts at a particular time and it doesn't suit your own scheduling, that could be an issue, um, uh, as well as some of the um, the other kind of localization and um, things that Yolanda brought up specifically about cultural issues. But that we just wanted to to really test this idea of the kind of prescribing course. That how valuable is that in terms of you're really prescribing something that somebody else has desi designed and is teaching for your students and you almost give 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 your students that opportunity and that, that does come with some um, potentially problematic issues just to say uh, it's a, I mean there isn't an answer to that but I just think it's worth just um, understanding the difference between the first two ways of using MOOC materials so what the first is this a standalone materials the second is as a kind of designed um, experience um, it might be worth thing with the timing that um, certainly the Coursera platform for example is now offering MOOCs very the same MOOC quite frequently so th that is maybe if you're choosing a particular MOOC um, not all MOOCs are offered in the same way so some MOOCs some of our MOOCs are offered twice a year, and so they have quite fixed start and finish dates. Some of our Coursera MOOCs are offered every four weeks. So that's, quite, that's also quite a difference. So that can, you know, looking at, at um, the, the cadence of, of MOOC offerings can, can um, help or, or hinder what you're trying to do in terms of using. I'm not sure if anything else has come up in the chat, or, or Jakob, if you want to... Um to comment, or if anybody else um, outside of the MOOC team wants to wants to um, say anything or ask a question. And I see that Hoik's talking about the way in which they're imagining, um, they're hoping that students will maybe engage with the course that's about to launch next month coming from Stellenbosch. So I think, you know, you, you're looking at ways to draw in and sort of, uh, you know, help people to share the different cultural perspectives in order to enhance the experience on the course. I think we'll be very interested to see how that works. Um, certainly that sounds like a, a good approach. But I think we're looking not so much um, at the individual's use taking the MOOC, but rather looking at like what else can you, other than just being a, a MOOC learner on a course, which is obviously what your own purpose why you've enrolled. We were sort of interested in, as an educator, perhaps, what ways in which it would be possible to best to make use of it. And I do think the issue of that you've been raising about time and the sort of temporal, the, the sort of the, the problem that might arise when you're trying to do things and it's not quite at the same time is obviously like a real barrier. And as just needs to be typed in about the different platforms do have different cadences of when the courses are offer, offered and that all would be something you have to take into account. I do think that uh, Yolanda's point about knowing what people are going to encounter as a, as a teacher is pretty important. And uh, in interviews that Tasmanian did with facilitators of the RAP move, sometimes it was quite hard for the facilitators if they weren't very, very familiar about the course and to know what students might be responding to. And your point, Yolanda, about preparing students what to expect and how it's going to, how it's sort of going to unfold. I would say that's obviously helpful if you've seen, taken the course yourself first um, and know in which way it could best fit. And then your point as well, Yolanda, about the pedagogical, what are you trying to prepare people for and how are you how are you linking it to your existing teaching it would be quite important. Um, Jakob, just picking up on Jakob's question, um, is would you see as a break of the pedagogical framework if somebody else only used elements? for their own courses. Um, well, we know uh, we um, license our the as, as much as possible the MOOC materials that we produce um, for reuse under Creative Commons licenses. So um, we 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 know that people do use them um, outside of the kind of 
as you might say, the sort of pedagogical design, they might download a few videos and use them in a different context. So it's very much to be encouraged, um, but just to say that um, it, 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 it is undeniable also that sometimes the, the materials are designed for a particular pathway and a particular type of learning experience. So in, in some cases, depending on the particular course, we might expect that students might not get the same experience. But I think you know when you're talking about MOOCs, it really is very much about um, offering pathways as suggestions and then people do what they what they want with them and that's very much part of you know one of the attributes of, of MOOCs as opposed to formal courses is, is that there is you, know, you, you put it out there but people will use it in such interesting and strange ways sometimes yes the the, the course structure uh, is 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 helpful for people who are studying because it's it's quite familiar and so the, the, the assessments and other um, activities and discussions have, have a kind of support structures with them and help with engagement which perhaps some library resources or some internet resources don't uh, and so th th this is why it, it educators um, are um, have been very interested in, in MOOCs in general and, and, and use them in the creative ways that, that we've tried to illustrate a few examples of this and it's it's this aspect that I think is um, is is not well under, un, understood of how people are getting around some of the real problems that I think you've all raised here around uh, uh, just practical problems of helping people um, engage with learning materials. But it's actually the educators who can really help find ways around some of these um, by knowing what the content is, by knowing the educational challenges. Um, students and learners face and uh, pl playing a positive role to, to, to help them overcome some of the, the barriers. Um, these are not necessarily what the people designing the MOOCs had intended, but they uh, um, often are, have been very creative uh, s solutions and enable people to get a, a lot out of the material that, that is out there. Okay, there's an interesting question from Yolanda here. Um, to what extent would you rely on a MOOC to provide opportunity for assessment? Anybody in the team want to take that on? I was saying depend a little bit on what your purpose would be because some of the MOOCs have got you know quite sort of solid MCQ kind of setups, particularly where there are fairly defined sets of skills. So, for instance, if you wanted to make sure your students could work with basic statistics, there's no reason why you couldn't set them a a, a MOOC to do and you'd sort of have some um, security that they, if they did follow the quizzes they would be able to sort of test their knowledge. Of course there's always the question of cheating on a MOOC, the so-called cheating, so you couldn't probably use it in any way as a formal assessment but certainly as a sort of practice um, transition preparation I think it's got great value. Things like the peer review is very interesting and I think could be quite a useful experiment for academics to, to get, get students to engage with other people both getting and giving feedback, because that is an important way of learning. It's not a formal assessment, but I think we'd all agree that when you have to give feedback, it's actually often as much of a learning as it is to get feedback. And and, and quite a few of the MOOCs have developed the, the peer review with nice rubrics in, in quite a solid way. So I really don't think, I think that will really depend on what you're trying to do with a MOOC, but I don't think that it's... It's, it could replace a formal assessment, but it could certainly supplement. Well, you can certainly have formal assessments outside the MOOC, and this is what a lot of the wrapping courses do, it, um, or, or the um, and, and some of those copyright X course that Jan talked about did that. Mm. So there's there's no reason why, if you're very concerned about that aspect of assessment, there are other ways of of, of assessing students' abilities. Um, often. But it needs an educator's eye to see whether the assessments in a in a MOOC are are appropriate, um, of the right level, and useful. And, and some of them are very good, and some of them are very bad. But it, it does need somebody to assess the, the value of that in, in, in that context. Um. Pick up on one of Nicholas's questions, um, which is: Do you think making use of MOOCs challenges more traditional approaches to teaching, or is it placing responsibility elsewhere? 
that's a good one. <laughs> um, I suppose it depends who 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 you are challenging. Maybe um, we, you know, one of the things that we've been um, running along with is a research project, which is um, looking at the impact of what making MOOCs has on educators' open educational practices. And certainly we've found some um, uh, you know, uh, tentative evidence that um, educators themselves, in some cases, have been challenged to reflect on their own teaching practices. There might be you know, traditional teaching practices. And we've had more than one educator comment that just thinking about making a short MOOC video um, and, and has, has made them reflect not only on how they might lecture, but also on the value of online for educational purposes, which perhaps they hadn't before. So um, perhaps in that case, um, it does um, help, it has helped in some cases challenge people's own um, practices um, and inspired reflection on their own what might be called traditional approaches to teaching. I don't know if that answers your question, Nicola. Okay, um, just looking down the questions. Um, one of the, the, one of the yeah. things you know, that, that was being raised quite a lot, I noticed in the forum last night, was that people are seeking for professional development, okay. and particularly, I think, their own. And certainly, I, I don't know, to speak for the rest of the team, but I've certainly taken courses very purposefully to look at things like learning design, approaches to assessment, some of the issues around online learning have been interesting. So uh, that's one of the things which would be quite useful for us to reflect on maybe here and also in the discussion forums going on. In, have, what have been the best uses that you've come across, you know, where you felt you've really learned something at, and it was a, you know, very useful? Would you recommend that kind of approach? Uh, what are the problems you have? Do you think the, you know, the things you would put forward has been quite strong proposing? So, so Janet, you're talking about personal Professional, as educators, yeah. Like, so, how to teach a particular thing, whatever your yeah, or might, it might be. Yeah, be like in the market, I was talking about you know, looking at some online courses and getting yeah. a wider experience to see what it actually looks like when you do this, yes, you know, yeah. a peer review of this kind or a particular kind of MCQ question, which I haven't had experience of doing. They want to take mm. some courses to see. So you almost, you almost like. It's almost like a self-study with a purpose that's above the actual course purpose. And it's like observe. And in fact, we did it as a group, as a team for a while. We said, in order to, we're engaging the field of making MOOCs, and we haven't got a training for this. So how are we going to know how to do it? So we have got basic uh, familiarity and, and, and experience with online learning, but not with MOOCs. So we went through quite a systematic process of taking MOOCs with the, with the sort of a framing of what is it about the design of this MOOC? What's working here? What is the purpose of these particular elements? Why have people put these things in? So we, we made it like a wrap for ourselves. Mm. So that, I would say, is, is almost like a professional development purposefully done using the MOOC material in order to observe certain things. And I'm sure you could do it from a variety of perspectives. Yes. yes. And, and the, other, the other angle to Nicola's question is, is that it, all, all good educators are looking out for things that they might share with students um, and learners which would help them overcome uh, uh, um, uh, either learning barriers or help them introduce them to new topics or get them excited about something. And I, I think MOOCs are, are one of the many examples of, of, of these that, that people are, are using. And this is the other aspect where it's not quite self-development, but it's, it's helping other people, recommending other people go through that process and, and, and help them through um, um, either difficulties or expose them to opportunities that they didn't know existed. Um, so you can, that's one level removed from yourself to achieve the same end. And I think that's, um, if I, I just can't remember the exact survey, but there was a large um, survey released by, um, 
I think it was Harvard and MIT MOOCs that showed that something like 39% of people taking those MOOCs were other educators. So that does indicate that, that a lot of people are finding um, that, that MOOCs can be you know, used for teaching professional development. And I think certainly one of the most exciting things about MOOCs, um, it's been a few years now, but especially at the beginning, was just to to enter somebody else's classroom and see what they were doing um, and see how they were teaching. And we're, you know, we're maybe a bit, a bit more used to it now, and it's not as exciting, but I, rem I do remember in the early days it, it was just quite thrilling in some ways just to be able to see how somebody else took a topic. Um, and it could be an inspirational or, in fact, the opposite. You, know, you, you, you could critically reflect on why we thought something wasn't working and, and participate as a learner as well. So the, um, it's been certainly, I think, for our team, um, you know, just, just doing and being learners as part of building your own online learning capacity. Um, yeah, so quite a few comments about, about that in the forum, um, with Jakob saying, in the recent Emerge Africa survey, numbers confirm that MOOCs and other online resources you highly use for professional development purposes. Um, and, then, and then Nicola raising whether there's such a sort of is it something as universal as professional development? I mean, I'm sure it obviously would have to be made relevant, and I think that'll be the question. What I'd really like to see a follow-up discussion about this. If this has been quite a big topic for us, is ways in which we could provide value as professional development. Let's talk about that. You know, um, have they? I mean, Nicola seems is concerned that they maybe not the best way to build local capacity around online learning. So perhaps let's look at one of the, that sort of question, mm -hmm. what would make it useful? And are there ways, and so we describe one of the ways that we did it, which is to sort of do it almost, and Yolanda was talking about an online version that Emerge Africa ran for a while. We ran a face-to-face -face version. So I think perhaps that is an important element, is where you are finding a way of wrapping that, whatever that might look like, which is to talk about the contextual and particular relevance and value to your group and purpose. Certainly that makes sense to me, but I'd like to hear from other people. Hi, Patrick. Um, I think, and, and it's partly related to what Tasneem's posted as well, which is the other issue that we haven't really talked about is, is certification, which we know is a huge issue for people taking MOOCs, especially in developing mm. contexts. Yeah. Is that you know you can take a MOOC um, and, it, and you can buy the certificate and if you're on Coursera you can apply for financial aid and, and get it for free um, if you can't pay. But what does it mean? What does that certificate actually mean to an employer or to um, you know? And, and so I think that that's something that we are um, interested in understanding how you know exactly what Tasneem said that how a MOOC certificate valued. We don't know. Um, really, we know that people are sharing those certificates in all sorts of um, spaces. Um, uh, the certificates have been designed to be easily um, integrated into LinkedIn profiles and, and other types of social media profiles. Um, are employers um, finding them useful? I, I don't know. I suppose um, in some ways, if, if, if you put them onto a CV or onto a motivation letter, it, it's better than not having them there. Um, but, you know, how, how valuable are they? Um, so we're very interested to hear your views, if you've got any experience about that. And if that is the case, and if they are becoming more valuable, how can we leverage that value in, in terms of the using aspect of it? And I guess it would be interesting to hear any, any examples people have or stories about whether there have been reports of the uses of certification on MOOCs, because I agree that... Um, Generally speaking, they, 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 they are a record of participation, but it doesn't have any formal recognition anywhere attached to credits and so on. So we have heard um, we have heard cases in, in the case which Tasneem's talking about, where quite often it's used internally um, you know, as sort of in-house training. Um, then it's been identified by the particular company or the example I was telling you about of the occupational therapists. So people see value in the learning, and therefore they would recognize it, but not actually recognition in the same way that it means the formal qualification. So I think that's still a barrier for, 
for our context. People really need to show, you know, hard evidence of skills they can use for CVs and job applications. And I think it, it, you know the space is developing in a fairly ad hoc manner, and it is a, you know it is a case by case basis. So if we think of the categories we introduced, um, the type courses that lend themselves more to um, certification and perhaps uh, CPD, continuing professional development, are going to be those category four courses that are more clearly aligned to a career building or career skills development course, especially if, for example, that MOOC is developed. With um, in association with a professional body, in which case that certific certificate would have more credibility, um, and and because it would be you know co-created almost along with the issuing authority, and that's quite different from perhaps certificates that um, might be available from a course from a sort of teaching showcase, for example, a category one. And we find this actually in our own MOOCs where sales of certificates, um, you know, which indicate popularity or use of the certificate vary across our MOOCs, and that does depend on the category and the purpose of that particular particular course as well. Um, after the one thing I wanted to mention, though, that the Kenya was raising is the issue of professional development, and that does seem to be the place where there's the most likely sort of traction around certification, and as she was saying, where there have been cases of common development uh, with a body, then it's sort of recognizing it, but what we've been battling with is that most of the professional bodies are locally based. So in almost almost all cases, professionals get a national recognition. Um, and so if you're creating a course that's got a global kind of profile and attempting to recruit across geographical and national boundaries, then the difficulty of finding something which could be you know, useful for all those people is pretty difficult. So you might be trying to get certification for, say, nurses in South Africa, but it wouldn't be the same for nurses in another country. That's one of the tricky things that, would have to, that has to be looked at. But there are examples I've seen in some of the uh, edX and Coursera courses where they've developed uh, courses with a, with like a very high-profile company, say, I don't know, uh, Google or something. Is it, I don't know, mm -hmm. those, mm -hmm. those, mm -hmm. Microsoft. Microsoft. Yeah. And then that obviously gives a huge value in the industry if you've got that kind of... Uh, so I think that is one of the ways that the MOOC, different MOOC partners are trying to pursue value for users. We have a link up with a corporate, high profile corporate partner like that. So um, I'm not sure, sure Jakob, we're coming to the end of the time, I think, but it's by it's, it's two. So I don't know if we wanted to, we'd like for really to continue the conversation for this. We've been really useful points raised for us during this chat. And uh, I, I'd just like to invite everybody here, and even those who, who don't, who haven't been able to join this, to take further some of these conversations in the in the forums in the next two days, because we'd like to pick it up on Friday, and with your assistance, try and develop some further, um, describe some further uses, both the, the opportunities that are presenting themselves, as well as some of the potential constraints and problems. So we'd just really like to invite you to conversation. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Um, back to you, Jakob. So thank you so much to, uh, to all of you, Andrew, Sukaina, Janet, and uh, Tasneem. Um, thank you, Janet. Uh, just to, uh, to, uh, to, to repeat that, uh, the, the team is planning another, or there will be another session, uh, Adobe Connect session, on Friday. That will be at uh, 3 o'clock uh, South African time. And of course, we welcome you all back to this particular session. Um, and just to once again promote our seminar landing page, um, you'll find it, uh, I'll just put it in here, um, bit.ly, a MOOC lens. And on this, site will be sharing uh, additional resources uh, on this discussion and we will also be providing the um, the slides from this session and the, also the, 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 the recording. Sorry, Sukena, uh, yes, that's correct. Uh, it's not correct time. It will be 11 o'clock on, on Friday. 
11 a.m. South African time. But we will uh, provide further information for that um, via our Twitter and uh, also our Facebook group and via the emails that we send out for those of you uh, who signed up formally to this uh, session. Once again, I would like to thank you to our presenters and I'm looking very much forward to, uh, to the further discussions that in our discussion forum that will also, there's also a link to that one on, on the landing page. And so uh, let's take this discussion further um, and let's get a bit under the issue and, and uh, what MOOCs can be used for and what other uses that, that can be. I'd like to wish you all a good afternoon and good evening if you get when you get there. And then hopefully see you all again on Friday.